My guest today is Mark Priolo, whom at the date this podcast comes out, is the newly appointed executive director to the Overture Maps Foundation. With the goal of building open map data, primarily aimed at people who are providing map services out to you know, a variety of applications. If you're anything like me, and you've spent some time in the mapping world, this sounds oddly familiar. An open project to map the world? All the way back in 2004, OpenStreetMap started because its founder, Steve Coast, couldn't access free open map data. So why start something new? I think there's actually a fairly bright line. You know, the way I would characterize it is, you know, what is the objective? What are you trying to do? Unlike OpenStreetMap, the Overture Maps Foundation has some very big tech company names behind it. Mark himself most recently comes from Meta, but it's also part of the Linux Foundation. This also isn't Mark's first time thinking about new mapping applications due to technological advancements. Time to first fix was one of the key metrics when you were selling GPS, and it was in minutes. But at the same time, there was this unique thing. Now, all of a sudden, anywhere on Earth you were, you could figure out where you were. And we take that for granted now, right? We pull out our phone, the blue dot magically appears. Back then, it was not. So this is a conversation about maps. After all, that's probably why you're here. But it's not just any conversation about maps. It's about how we make them and who the beneficiary is. People making them or those using them. Before we get started with the interview, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is OpenCage. If you work with addresses and location data, chances are you're going to need a geocoder. Geocoding is the act of translating coordinates, so think latitude and longitude, that are created by smartphones and tracking devices into human understandable places, like street names and place names, or the other way around. So OpenCage provides a geocoding API, which is built on top of open data sources, one of them being OpenStreetMap. This allows them to provide their geocoding API at a pretty low cost, as well as having pretty loose licensing terms compared to proprietary platforms. So you can do things like store the data as long as you want, display it on any map and use it publicly or behind a firewall. So if it's built on top of open data sources, you may be wondering, like, why wouldn't you be able to do it yourself? Well, you can totally make your own geocoder, but what OpenCage provides is just a simple API that works and that is reliable. Basically, they take care of all the maintenance. For example, OpenStreetMap alone gets edited four to five million times a day. On top of that, OpenCage provides information like local time zones, what currency people use, and which phone code is used. Because OpenCage is based around open data, that means their pricing is also pretty affordable. And they have a pretty generous free trial that I encourage you to go take a look, especially if you're just playing around or are doing a personal project. Finally, which is pretty close to my heart, they've been long supporters of the open source community and just geospatial community as a whole. So if this sounds interesting, you can go to the link in the description to see more about them. Uh, as, as you probably know, I start these conversations the same way every time. I like asking people how they uh, would describe themselves. Quite curious, how would you describe yourself? It's funny, like as everyone, there's many different dimensions you describe yourselves on. Uh, in the professional world, I'm, I'm, uh, I've just been in the mapping business for a long time, and that kind of makes me a bit of a one-trick pony uh, in the sense that I know a lot about a very specific thing. Uh, so, so I think that's like one of the things in the professional side. I think, um, you know, if I were to kind of place myself, I, I'm not a technologist. I, I uh, would not be mistaken for one. But by the nature of what I've done, I think you work around technology a lot. Uh, you better be pretty conversant with it. You better understand it and understand the implications and the directions. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of where I would place myself. Uh, in that. Um, but that's, that's, I think, one of the ways I'm, I'm known outside of that, you know, a lot of other interests. But uh, uh, for these purposes, I think pretty much identified with the mapping world. You said not technologist. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there things that you are? Like, I, I like that. There, I talk to a lot of people who emphasis that, like, I'm not yeah. close to the technology itself. But could, could you expand on some of the things that you are? 
You know, I think, and this is a bit evolutionary. I mean, I um, I was a chemical engineer in university, so I, I've not. That's not one thing I'm clearly not. Any chemical engineer would not associate with me in that regard. But I think that one of the things through some of the experiences I had was I developed a fairly good long view of where the industry is going, and then I think. Uh, more and more, one of the things I'm doing is looking at where the industry will go and how companies sort of position themselves for it. So, so that sort of intersection of what's happening with the technology and then therefore what the strategy you would want to, uh, to, to execute to, to kind of be in keeping with that is sort of the sweet spot where I, where I've, I, uh, you know, have been most recently at Meta and, and in many jobs before that. Uh, has been working on partnerships and business development. Business development, I think, is a fairly fungible title. It means very different things in different companies. Uh, but I think both of those are sort of in the space of uh, thinking about how companies can work together around things that aren't necessarily on their on their sales sheet. They're not necessarily things for sale, but places where by kind of coming up with creative um, exchanges of value, you can come up with some pretty interesting deals. And that, that's that's really, I think, where like I've gravitated towards probably for the last five, six years. This is why I'm quite excited to talk together is because those things aren't things that I'm personally very familiar with. I mean, I, I understand a little bit, but I'd, I'd love to dive into all of those things a little bit deeper. Um, the, the first thing I'm, I'm really curious is if we go all the way back to the beginning, I, I like understanding where people come from a little bit. H- how do you go from you said you majored in chemistry to chemical engineering, chemical engineering. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you, I think I, one of the first jobs you had then was working at Tribble. If you go way back, the first real job I had was making bleach for the Clorox company. Okay, great. <laughs> which, well, which let's go there. Which chemical engineering uh, as I ever did. I, I quickly moved out of that. So what happened? Making bleach. No, no, no. Like that jump, like that transition. Like how did you? Well, it, it was a couple of different things, but I, I, I worked, uh, you know, as, as a chemical engineer, I, I worked in a bleach plant, literally. Um, and then in a, a couple of different jobs, went to graduate school. And then when I came out, I was working in a couple, uh, actually two interesting technology companies that taught me different things. One was a relatively unscientific or untechnical product that was sold with incredible attention to how you differentiate based on technology. So that a lot of training and, and really sort of taught me sort of making a difference at the point of sale by really understanding the technology and customer needs. Uh, and then the second job I was in the disk drive industry. We were talking about this a little bit before. Um, and the disk drive industry is weird because it's a very, very advanced technology that is essentially sold as a commodity. You sell, essentially sold it as dollars per, in those days, megabytes. Um, so it's the price physical storage, right? Physical storage, yeah. Spinning disk drives, and uh, you know, and and it was just a very commodity sale for what was an incredibly technology advanced uh, company. So, um, so that was sort of interesting. Um, from there, really, just through someone I knew, I got a job at Trimble Navigation, uh, working in what was then called the OEM group, and we were selling like credit card sized. <laughs> Uh, uh, GPS receivers um, to whoever would buy them for us. And they, they were quite expensive and they didn't work very well. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I think we were talking the other day, it's like, I, I'm kind of amazed like it ever happened because they really didn't work very well. And uh, you had to spend a lot of time acquiring satellites. Uh, you know, you get them, the, 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 the signal was dithered so that like it, you weren't super accurate. Um, but there was a need and you ended up kind of finding out which markets could live with those limitations and sell there uh, and then point towards where it could go as the technology got better. Yeah, this is one of the things as, as I was reading up on on some of the things that you've done, it seemed like a lot of the work you've done is is finding the places where, given the limitations of the technology, you still find applications. I think we, we talk about a lot about like, oh, this new technology enabled a lot of these things. but but even before, like GPS is a really good example. It's it's something that gradually yeah. got better. There were yeah. still applications when I I was reading up. Like you, um, you wrote about how it used to take minutes to get a, a signal to on on a yeah. GPS. Like that that just 
none of the applications away, right? we have today work with that. None of them would work. Yeah, it you know, and it, it was. I mean, in the early days uh, of GPS, you had to download some. If you're starting from scratch, you had to download something called Ephemeris. I don't remember the numbers, but time to first fix was one of the key metrics when you were selling GPS, and it was in minutes. I mean, it was it was a long time, and you needed full view of the sky. And, you know, it's just, it was really horrible. And uh, I mean, you would get in your car, put the patch antenna on the roof and just sit there for three or four minutes until you got a fix before you could start driving. So, you know, it really is amazing that like, like it went on, but at the same time, there was this unique thing, which was that now all of a sudden, anywhere on earth, you were almost anywhere, uh, you could, you could figure out where you were. And, and while we take that as sort of for we take that for granted now, right? We pull out our phone, the blue dot magically appears. Back then it was not for granted. And and but that's an amazing capability, right? Because like all of a sudden you can put a it, there was no blue dot at the time, but you can figure out where you are anywhere in the world. And it's really it's really stunning. Uh but you know, now and I mean it's not that long ago. I'm I'm on the older side, but not that old. And uh but it's it's like for granted, right? I mean it's just like yeah, of course you can't. Why? Why wouldn't we get frustrated when when we don't get it in like three seconds? Do Do you think it, I I was really reflecting on that, and it, I think that there's a lot of value in in knowing where things come from. Like I think it it helps being a, a bit more grateful for things that we do have for those three seconds. Um, but specifically on that story, do, do you think like it, it was really important to have a vision of like where this could go, like to kind of believe in the potential that it had it's easy in hindsight to see like oh it's just going to get better but in the moment you don't know that i i think it i think it is and you know the example i think of is i worked for trimble uh took a little bit of time off did some different things came back and worked for a company called surf technologies s-i-r-f and surf was really the gps company that i think was pretty dominant when, if you remember, uh, sat navs or personal nav devices, you know what TomTom originally started with, and some other companies, and and sort of the beginning of GPS in the phone or GNSS in the phone, and one of the things they did when they were just a tiny little startup is they commissioned an artist to come up with these concepts of what knowing any where you were all the time would lead to, and they showed, you know cars with GPS, uh, games with GPS, uh, phones with GPS, you know, all these, all these things that didn't exist, couldn't exist from the technology at the time, but you could look ahead to. And uh, that company went public some years later. And I mean, even then at that point, a lot of those things still hadn't happened or hadn't happened very well. But it was interesting to see that back then, those things were forecastable, right? They were, they were knowable that that's where this was going. And, uh, and I think, I think, I think that's important. I mean, the other interesting, uh, collateral thing is a lot of patents were filed in the very early days of GPS about location services that really didn't envision location in connection with an internet. But if you read them the way sometimes patent lawyers do could cover that. And so they became fairly valuable patents because people sort of had this vision of, of what could become. The first thing that comes to mind is just like, that's kind of what science fiction is in a way, except yeah. what you're describing seems like it's more done in a, in a corporate setting, but the idea of mandating an artist to try to look at what can this look like, that that's just really does seem like that's what science fiction authors do when yeah. they, when they write their own stories. Well, you know, we looked at that book, that books of, it's like a physical paper book because that's the way people did things back then. And uh, we looked at it and like, like all that's like, Oh yeah, this is a picture of the iPhone. Oh yeah, this is a you know you you saw like what those things became, and uh, you know it wasn't exactly right, obviously, but um, but you know all the concepts were there. I I need to look for that. I kind of want to find try to find. Yeah, that. I'll 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 try and I I know a couple of people who may have that. I'll try and dig that up. That would be fun to see. Yeah, that if we if we can find it, I'll I'll try to see if we can put it in the show notes. That would be really cool. Um, I I do want to move forward, and you've done a lot of things, and I, I want to kind of. Uh, move the clock fast forward to kind of the recent news, what, what's going on right now. So you've been announced as the executive director for the Overture uh, Foundation. Yeah, Overture Maps Foundation. Is Overture Maps Foundation, name. thank yeah. you. Um, and I noticed when you started at the very beginning, you, you mentioned that it was working in partnership with different companies, how they can work together. The, the foundation's been announced with 
multiple really big corporate uh, partners working together. We've got Meta, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and TomTom. I think I've got all of the the big ones. Um, that sounds like the definition of a lot of big people uh, trying to work together on on a common goal. Before we go, like, can you just explain at a high level? Um, if people have never heard about it, what, what is the foundation doing and what's the goal? Yeah, so <clears throat> Overture Maps Foundation was announced actually back this last December um, with the goal of building uh, open map data uh, primarily aimed at a customer uh, that is people who are providing map services out to you know a variety of applications. And, and it really was sort of founded on a couple different uh uh, core tenets. One, one was uh, there was a strong belief that uh, map data could could and should uh, be open, and and uh, there's a variety of reasons for that. Everyone thinks open data is like a cost play, but I, I don't think it's really just a cost play. I think it's it, um, I think it's also a shared space play, right? I mean, if we all agree on what the map looks like, then our products begin to interact with each other because we're working in the, like this common spatial framework. So one was uh, data should be open. The other is if data needed to be open, it needed to meet the demands of um, the applications that are out there. And, you know, as we were sort of talking about GPS, mapping applications have progressed and will continue to progress for the next 10 years. I mean, I think there's like there's so much stuff that's going to happen. And the map data that underlies those map uh, those mapping applications needs to therefore progress at the same way in the same way and so um really it, 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 and and then you know the the other thing about that is that uh you know that needed to be or would best be done in a coordinated effort a collaborative effort so we started uh overture in december we announced it in december um you're right at the founding it had uh four companies all pretty large uh, companies. Since that time, it's expanded to, you know, uh, over a dozen, around 15 more companies, including some fairly small companies. And it really, that was always a plan. The plan was always that uh, the best open map is going to be built by a large collaboration across a range of different uh, uh Com it's not company sizes, it's government entities, it's it's nonprofits, but people who can use the map and then feed back into it uh, to make the map better. Because one of the, you know, one of the things I think we've seen in mapping is the best map is the map that's used the most. If it's used the most, more people see it as the world changes, changes are detected, those changes are fed back, and the map becomes better. And so that that I think has always been the goal that that be a uh, a large community and a pretty uh, you know certainly not all big tech and you know if you look at some of the folks who've joined um, they're starting to span a pretty wide range of uh, of company sizes. The uh, I think like a lot of people and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. The, the first thing that comes to mind when when I saw the the announcement of this is well hang on a minute there already is an open map sure out there uh sure it, it's in the it's in the name with open street map and i know you've been involved with that project for a really long time uh since yeah. a lot of the early days so can we address that what how does overture fit compared to open street map yeah i think uh i think there's actually a fairly bright line uh, you know clear line in there and i think the way i would i would uh characterize it is in terms of um you know what is the objective what are you trying to do Mm. And I think um, if if you look at OpenStreetMap in you know from a variety of angles, what they say about themselves, uh, what's in their strategic plan or strategic plan outline, um, the the conversations, really what OpenStreetMap um, focuses on and does extraordinarily well is build a worldwide community of people who are each contributing to the map, right? Whether they're com contributing locally or they're using an online editing program, they're com they have individuals building the map. And a lot of the emphasis there is really on building that community, building it internationally and worldwide, building a diverse community, because it turns out that the more diversity you have in that, the more different things you map and the, the more multifunctional. Um, and so I think that's like a fairly unique and distinct thing and actually not something that Overture really intends to do. Um, 
Overture, on the other hand, is aimed at a different customer base. And, and our kind of focus is who are people that are building map services, offering maps out through those services to, you know, whatever their customer base is and what do they need? And, and fundamentally, there are three things. One is um, the, the input data, the map data will come from a variety of sources. So community data is important and, you know, we make heavy use of OpenStreetMap data. But there are also other sources, right? There's there's sources of uh, open government data that's used quite a bit, and that's very good data. It needs to be, you know, that can be used. And then increasingly, we're seeing data generated through a combination of sensors and various computer processing and auto, uh, artificial intelligence to make more data. So, uh, using all those data source types, um, bringing it in, doing pretty rigid quality control. Uh, on that, and then uh, putting it out in an organized schema that that people building map applications need to provide those services, and then allowing other data that's maybe not open to be added on top of that a reference system. So those are, I think, you know, well at the top surface, everyone goes, oh, it's all map data. They're actually fairly distinct missions and fairly distinct objectives in there. I think. I. Yeah, so I, I want to try to rephrase that. You're saying that, it, from what I'm understanding, is that Overture is really trying to build an open product in, in the sense, like, is really taking in whatever customers, and in, in, in this case, um, some of the big organizations that are working on taking their needs into account and then building something around that. Whereas OpenStreetMap isn't really trying to build a map for someone and and the community of people doing it is is more at the core is that a fair assessment uh, yeah i don't know that i would i i don't know that people in open street map would say they're not trying to build something for something i i but but i do but i do think that the focus of open street map has been on building what they call in the strategic plan the mapping process so it's just essentially a process of humans in the human mapping, hu humans building the map based on observation. And, uh, you know, classically that was like visual observation, right? I look at it, I put it on the map. And now it's increasingly, you know, uh, observation through tools, but it's all around that community building it. And if you think about it, that's not necessarily compatible with like, let's say, AI evolves, right? And all of a sudden you've got this, this network of sensors feeding data back in, using AI on it to infer changes in the, the uh, world and then putting those straight into the map. Well, that's not necessarily compatible with local mapping, right? Because you're there mapping your neighborhood and all of a sudden you're being overwritten by things. So I, I, I think that actually they're fairly distinct uh, and different um, uh, missions. I was reading, you, you wrote about this idea of the artist versus the merchant to, to describe this. I found this to be quite helpful to, to grasp. Like I, I like analogies a lot and I'm going to try to explain it and you're, you'll tell me if I, if I got this right. But the, the artist, <laughs> I think I wrote that a long time ago. I hope I remember it. It was a couple of years ago. It's not that old. <laughs> um, so the, the idea was that the artist is, is all about the craft. It's about the, the, the way, um, just like an artist is, is you're making something, but the process of making it, that community aspect, that is uh, what OSM was about. For the artist, it's the process of doing it. And then the merchants are, the tools don't really matter, the outcome does. The, the outcome, the map that comes out, that was what OSM was. And from what I recall you writing there is that there was a disagreement of what the value of OSM was. For those two different groups, the value was different. For the um, one is the process, the other is the outcome. Is that a fair settlement? You know, I, I, I try not to put words in other people's mouths on these things, but I do think that um, OpenStreetMap has developed a really interesting, compelling vision around the community. And if you look at their strategic plan outline, a big part of that in the strategic plan outline is how do we build this big community? And that's that's really what I think it has been about, is building that community. And, and to some extent, not wanting to incorporate things that would 
take away from that community, right? Take away agency or, or, uh, or, and, and I think for a long time, maybe when I wrote that piece, I think there was a bit of a struggle be- between people who wanted to build and maintain that community and other people who like, quite honestly, wouldn't care if the map like descended from heaven if it was good, right? I mean, they didn't care about how it got built. It's just they needed a good map. And and I think that has been sort of a fundamental fil- philosophical divide in OpenStreetMap. I think with Overture, it sort of separates those two out. And it doesn't mean they're they're competitive. It, it actually, I think in my mind, means they're very complementary. And, um, you know, I, I hope that they, they, they do become very complementary. But, but I do think you have to recognize that there are two different um, ambitions for, for there, right? And, if, and, and building a community of local mappers is not always harmonious with building a map through the best means possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That that's I mean, I'm I'm trying to understand like as well, like why did you see the need to create this new foundation on like yeah. because it does seem like it, it could have very well been an effort that that is tied to OpenStreetMap itself. But it's that's why I'm asking that. I'm just trying to understand the the, the needs. I uh you know I I I, I don't know I mean, you know, it's interesting because I think that, uh, you know, if you kind of play that out, right, if you play that out, then what that does is it has large companies coming to OpenStreetMap and saying, hey, we need maps like this, right? We need you to map that. We need you to integrate AI and sensors into your process. And I'm not brave enough to have made that request to OSM. I mean, I, I think that would be rejected out of hand. I think, I think, I hope many people in the OSM community would say that's not what we're about. Um, and so I think in some sense, um, you know, it, it, what Overture does is actually recognizes what OSM is and what they do very well. And look, Overture will lean heavily on on OSM. I mean, that is the best, really an amazing map data source. And, you know, I think you see things that OSM does that Overture will never do, right? So an example of that recently was the earthquakes in Turkey. You know, the OSM community mobilized to quickly build a much better map of the affected regions in a way that I don't think Overture will will match, you know, in any foreseeable future. And so I think there are really amazing things that, that OpenStreetMap will do that Overture cannot do. Right. I I, I want to like th- there is a history of of some of these companies doing a lot of edits on o- OSM though um, Meta and I think Apple yeah. Apple is not part of Overture but um, th- let's talk about Meta there's been a lot of edits that have been done by people under the Meta umbrella on OSM directly so I want to challenge that a little bit about the not not doing what to do why why couldn't it is, have been in the same um why couldn't the uh, that the work that meta and google and all these other companies do ends up doing under that umbrella the same way the yeah. edits have been done yeah no and and i mean meta is not the only one right right there's yeah, a yeah, fairly yeah. significant corporate community that is is and continues to um edit and into open street map and i think there are certain types of edits that you know, that that works extremely well for. I mean, uh, you know, looking at, at things, finding things that have changed in the ground, making edits on them. One of the core parts, I think, of OpenStreetMap, and there is an exception to this, I, re- I recognize, is that edits are done sort of feature at a time, right? I mean, I, I see something, that road's not right, that house not right, that address is not right, I go in and edit it. Um, th- there's another category in OpenStreetMap called imports, which are sort of bulk edits. And you put them in. So let me give you an example. When we were, and we uh, we had a uh, at Meta with a few collaborators, we put out a product called Daylight. And one of the things we did, we looked at with Daylight, is pulling in other open data from cities. And so one um, one example, the first example was uh, the city of Redlands in California. Which, if you know anything about Redlands, you might guess who helped us get that. Um, but it was building footprints in Redlands and. OpenStreetMap had 3,000 building footprints. The city of Redlands had 33,000 building footprints. And so you would look at that. And, and the way we 
imported that to OSM as we put it in a tool called Rapid, and a user could look at a building footprint and a satellite image, and you could click and say, yes, that's in, and you'd add it one at a time. And if you did that 30,000 times, you'd add the entire database. A different way of looking at that would say all 33,000 of those building footprints were built by the same methods and technologies. If one's good, they're probably all good, and you would just put them all in. And, and I think Overture is much more inclined to do the latter, whereas OpenStreetMap would much more likely do the former. That's a, that's a really good example to try and understand. The... And, and by the way, you can, you can extend that, right? I mean, um, if you had a lot of GPS traces, you can end up defining road geometries down to the lane level pretty, pretty well, right? And, uh, but that's, that's a very different type of map building than individual editors adding streets and roads. So I, I think you can go down the road thinking about various different ways that would apply. The, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm asking is because, right, like a lot of the conversation we've had there is really about just map nerds talking about how to build a map, um, which is really interesting, but most people don't and care about that. you say that, that like that's not like super important. It's really important. And <laughs> I can- most I, of my conversation. <laughs> but what I mean is that when um, you're driving down the road and you want to know the shortest way to go from A to B, you really don't care how the map was made. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would agree, right? And and I think one of the things, if you're in the position of companies offering map services, is you have to think, is that experience static, right? Is that experience kind of done? Kind of like we were talking about, like GPS, how good it was or how bad it was. Is that done? And, and I mean, I look back 10 years, 10 years ago, driving instructions were drive down here and in, you know, X kilometers, take a right or whatever it is. Now it's here's what the road signs look like. Here's what the lanes on the road look like. Here's the lane you need to be in to turn. Um, you know, it, it, the level of detail that's gone up, you know, from 10 years ago to now is just huge, right? I mean, and, and so the map data has to support that, right? And then the other part, I think, that's a dimension besides like the, the uh, detail is the timeliness, right? That exit is closed because someone is work cutting down trees on it today, today, like literally today. And I'm mad at my navigation system because it told me to get off there and it didn't know that the city was cutting down trees on that exit, you know? And, and so like, it needs to be updated like immediately. And so, so then take and think about 10 years forward, what's gonna happen on that? Well, I think it's gonna continue to increase, right? It, out, you know, within things like ADAS, autonomous vehicles. So I think one of the things you have to recognize is the demand on map services has grown tremendously. And I don't see that stopping, right? You go 10 years ahead and it's, and, and so that requires data to be different, right? Every time I look at a map application, my brain's thinking, what's the data that makes that happen? And that the requirements on that data have gone up tremendously in the last 10 years. And I think, I, I think there's a fairly solid argument they will go up a lot higher in the next 10 years. The, uh, the thing that really comes to mind when you, you I've heard you talk about this before. The, the thing that I um, recalled was, when I talked to Steve Coast, who's the founder of OSM, we had a really long conversation and uh, got to pick his brain a lot. And, and he said this thing that just really stuck, which is if Tesla really wanted to, they could create a whole new map every single day, not yeah. Yeah. from anything, but from scratch. I mean, yeah. of course, it, it would be way harder than just doing it like that. But yeah. if they really wanted to, they probably could go down that road, uh, pun intended of just mapping everything like they have a huge number of cars on the road and they could just map everything and so you would have a map that is one day old every time and that is a completely different paradigm shift from uh, something that's a little bit more static that gets appended over time um, and you're saying that that comes from also different needs and I'm really curious, like, what are some of the needs that you're seeing changing? Like, the reason I'm bringing that up is because uh, Steve mentioned that Tesla is not, they could do that, but they're not doing it because that's just not the need that they have today. Um, but I'm, I'm curious as to what are some of the needs that you're seeing change today um, in, in kind of the 
the that we need today, but also in the next few years. Yeah. Um, and and I, I thought that was a very like like that statement out of your rather long interview with Steve Coast um, really stuck with me, too. Right. I mean, that is a very different mindset of how to build maps. I, I don't know that you could do it today exactly, but but I get his point. Um, I think that as you look at mapping, there are uh, several different things. And, and one of them is. And, you know, I made this point before is that like every time the data gets better, the applications get better. And every time the applications get better, customer expectations go up. And so you get this cycle of escalation. Um, you know, an example that I always use is, you know, if you think about a navigation app and it telling you when you're going to get there, right, your estimated time of arrival. Um, 10 years ago, like you were lucky if you even got an ETA, right? But but now you want that ETA. And I measured on four hour trips to the minute, like how accurate were they to the minute? And so my expectation of what a mapping service and think about if you're in a business, right? If you're in a ride sharing business or a logistics business or something like that, they make money. They monetize on like that, those differences in accuracy. And so I think that's going up a lot. I think the um, it, but with that, you need better quality control, right? Because now you're dealing with a flow of data coming in and you need to be able to effectively quality control that and uh, and put it out. Um, so I think I think that's something we're going to see. I think, uh, you know, I think increased attribution, uh, like the features on the map is something we're going to see. And I think, you know, there's a couple different vectors that could go, but obviously the autonomous vehicle industry is looking at kind of a very different sort of map with with much higher accuracy much uh, uh, uh more granularity if you look at some of the things you know for the metaverse or augmented reality applications like it's got to be a lot more 3d right for one thing um the precision is much higher because if you want to place a digital asset on a physical asset you need to know where that physical asset is, right? It needs to be there. You're dealing with things like occlusion, where you know things go around buildings. That building better be right. I, I tell, I can tell you, if the building's not right, it looks weird. It's a bad experience. And so, I think that you know, as I look forward, you've got those types of things, and then just like the timeliness of it, right? It's it's got to be up to date, and we see people getting incredibly impatient if the map is is out of date like i heard someone saying like they the, the second hand but like someone was complaining that their navigation app took them down a street and there was a moving van in the street that was blocking the street and they're mad at the nav app but i'm thinking like <laughs> <laughs> like reset your expectations here people right. um yeah. but, but that but i mean you know if you think about it if you have really accurate real-time traffic flow like with a mass grid of sensors you would know that, right? You would know that there was a a that a blockage there and route around it. Yeah, I that's such a great example. Uh, one thing I like doing when I go home with family is like ask them about what app they use to to drive around, because um, there are a lot of these, and I hear that people, uh, at least in France, I don't know how it is in other countries, but there's a lot of people around me use Waze be exactly because of that reason, because it's a just the network of people using it in France at the moment is so big that if you have that van that's stuck in a small road, there's maybe 10 cars that are going to pass by and get stuck by it. And at least one of them is going to have ways and going to be stuck there. And so you are going to get that data. And so that expectation is kind of met a lot of the time. I think that's right. And, and so when it's met, we start to expect it, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. We, right, and and uh, but I think that goes back to the point, which is you know I think one of the things, and actually Waze is a really good example. I think there were other examples, but Waze was like the most publicly prominent one that like people know about. Where uh, you know if you think about maps historically, map makers made them. They somehow got them out to people in the world. People in the world went and used them. And, uh, you know, and they're right or wrong, but the, the flow back of information was like years, right? I mean, that you feedback know, and, and, yeah. And when mm -hmm. I got into this business, the, the cycle time between, uh, error detected in the map to error fixed in the map was 18 months. That was like the industry standard and that, but now, you know, and you think about like, um, and ways is a good example, 
you're pushing data out to the end user, but as the end user is using it, uh, the end user is feeding data back about the accuracy or lack of accuracy of that map. And if you can process that data, then you start to get the thing that Steve Coast said, which is like, I'm changing the data all the time. And if you get really good at that, then you get to you know Steve's point, which is like, so rather than maintain a map, just throw it away every night and replace it, which we're not there. But I think that's a trend, right? I mean, I think that's where this goes is, is the, the map, at least pieces of it, that get replaced very frequently. This, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you is, as we're going towards that, the, what I wanted to ask is, what's Overture going to provide? Because it seems like the short answer would be, it's just data, it's map data. But what we're talking about is that um, that data is constantly changing. It's, so it's maybe a stream of data uh, is like what it ends up being, or it's the tooling, the way to build that data. So it's whatever algorithm we use to extract features from satellite images or how you process uh, input data from a, a stream of cars. And so I'm really curious as to what do you think uh, the, the value of what Overture provides is going to be down the line? So, so I'll give you a little bit of a uh, cop out answer, and then hopefully go on the blanks. <laughs> Let's um, do it. I, I, I think that the 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 way I would answer that is by going back to what I said about who is Overture's service, you know, who who is Overture's customer. Overture's customer are uh, companies that are provide uh, providing map services. So the cop out answer is Overture should provide data in the way those services need it to offer the services they they need to provide. Um, to, so today, like, let's be really clear. Today, uh, you know, Overture is about four or five months old. A lot of the work that's being done, and there is a lot of work being done that you can see inside the community, is really done on things that are semi-invisible. Uh, one of the things we said is we're going to develop a data schema. Uh, we're going to develop a reference system to allow people. And that's a lot of like not very interesting work, right? That's a, that's a lot of uh, important work, but not very interesting. And, and but but longer term. Um, overture, you know, sh will I think evolve to meet that need? And um, you know, right now, kind of the state of the art is you can download data on kind of a batch process, but that's got to move towards a more continuous process. If this thing happens, right? If this thing about a continually updating map uh, happens, and and I think you know that's that's something that for Overture to be successful, we need to be. Uh, you know, very attuned to what the industry needs. And, and I think, you know, the, the market's going to tell us, right? I mean, the market tells you very quickly and sometimes harshly if your services aren't meeting its needs. And, um, uh, you know, so I think that that will be an evolving thing. That is a bit of a cop-out answer. I'll, I'll, I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, it is. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I think Overture recognized is this is hard stuff, right? Oh, this sure. is this is hard stuff. You know, and, and one of the things we've looked at that I that I hope Overture can bring is processing technology that's really at at, at world scale. And you know, one um, you know, as I look at as I look at at Overture, there's sort of inputs, data inputs that you use to build maps. And there are processes that how you process that. And then there's obviously the output from that. But I think Overture has a real potential to collect the widest range of inputs and have an amazing array of processing technology uh, to process that data into the type of data that, that, uh, that the, the customers needs. And, you know, like we're looking at um, you know, one technology that, that Meta brings, for instance, is tremendous computer vision technology. So you can put um, <clears throat> this will, you know, in, in my non tech, you put pictures in one side and get map data out the other. Right. Mapillary did that very well. But as you look at that and you look at what's happening in AI, you think, man, there is tremendous potential there to, uh, you know, go from imagery, whether it's aerial imagery or street level imagery, or, you know, maybe even imagery taken by people on their cameras 
and take that and process that into, you know, map data, which is then fed into the system. So, you know, that processing technology is, is really amazing. And I mean, just look, I mean, frankly, in the last five months, it's, it's yeah. stepped ahead. Yeah, the the I think just to linger on that, like uh, Meta just released segment anything. I think yeah, it's isn't called. that cool? Yeah, uh, seg- segment anything. Yeah, which is this for, for people who are not familiar, which is this really big pre-trained model that um, does uh, semantic segmentation, which doesn't sound like it should be very uh, exciting because we've been doing that <laughs> you, for you a long time. So? <laughs> But it does it on anything without pre-training. Yeah. That's that's yeah. the whole point of why it's so cool. And so people have started using it on satellite images, on street view, on things like that, because it just wor- it should work on anything. You're right. Segmentation's been around for a while, but the the apparent lack of need to do a lot of training to get fairly decent results is is amazing. And you know, we had uh, so you know, uh, again, this has been out a couple of weeks, right? I think the, the 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 way I like to think about these things usually is is just that when you lower the amount of friction that's required to do something, you can drastically increase the the reach uh, and and how widely it can be used, how easily it can be used. And so in this case, the value is how easy it is to get a segmentation out of an image, whereas before it required having a whole data set of that specific thing uh, to. to to get it segmented. I think that's a that's one recent example of what that can look like. Yeah, and you know, we we um, you know, I know someone took some aerial imagery of cities, put it in there and pulled out crosswalks like very very quickly. And and so like crosswalks are important map data, right? If you're building uh different maps. So so I mean, I think the ability to do that on a wide scale, right? Cuz someone could do that, right? It's not like no one could ever segment out crosswalks. <laughs> Um, but now to be able to use a, you know, widely available tool to do it very quickly is, is revolutionary. I mean, and, and that's not going to change, right? I mean, like, where's that going to be in three years? It'll be pretty amazing. The next thing I want to move on is one of the things, a lot of what you say makes a lot of sense. There's one thing that gets me a little confused is why go down the foundation route? This seems like the value, if you can make a really good map. Uh, that's you know up to date and all the things that we talked about the, the last 45 minutes we we take uh we took to talk about you let's say we get all of that the amount of value you can get on the other hand is huge and um i know that if you spend any time in the mapping industry what people say is making a map is really hard um but i'm still curious why go down the kind of open and foundation side i mean it's part of the linux foundation rather than keeping that as a more closed still partnership between companies i'm really curious to understand why that happened or how that happened yeah it's a good question i think um i think there are a couple different pieces to it and and one is um you know at some level if you look at this you say that if if you kind of project ahead the best map to make to to provide these map services that we're kind of envisioning is going to be made by the widest range of inputs and and uh, and and sensors processed through the most advanced technology. And what one of the things we saw, and even for very fairly big companies, is for they have some of those inputs, but no one has all of those inputs, right? I mean, no one no one has all of those. And you know, I've worked for a fairly big company. And we have some great signals, but we don't have all the great signals. And you know, if you look at data sets, one of the ways I think those data sets get better and better is you you come at them from a couple different angles, right? And you know, if you think about um, if you think about places data, right? There's about five or six different ways you can build places data. You can you know crawl the web, you can do crowdsourcing, you can use business listings, you can uh, get information directly from the vendors, and I'm probably forgetting a couple others. Each of those has some good parts and some parts where they'll have blind spots. But if you can combine them, then maybe you get like the best, right? That's so. So part of it is on the just the the question of how is this map going to be the best it can be but the other part i think that this may be more important is on the usage of it and one of the questions if you think about today um 
you know, if, if you and I are going to meet somewhere, uh, we're going to come to a, a, a destination and you're going to get there your way. I'm going to get there my way. We'll probably be staring at our phones, looking at something and going. But you might use one map. I might use another. And hopefully, if they're good maps, we both get to the same place. But if you project ahead, the map actually, and I think Steve Steve kind of said this, Steve Co said this in like the map's going away. I kind of took issue with that. The map isn't going away, but the map is you become in the map, right? And whether you look at um, autonomous vehicle applications or augmented reality applications, you're no longer looking at your phone at the map. You are in the map, right? You are in a city and augmented reality as, uh, artifacts are being positioned on the physical uh, physical world. And so that requires, if we're in the map, not looking at the map, that requires that we have the same spatial reference, right? If you've got some wearable from company A and I have some wearable from you know company B, we need to have the same interaction uh, around that, which means that that map, we believe, should be common, right? It, it ought to be common. So, so I, think, I think kind of as you project ahead from where we are now, there's a fairly compelling rationale that the map isn't just open because like no one wants to go do it on their own. It's open because it kind of has to be open. It, it needs to be a shared spatial framework that we start to align things in. And um, I, I think that'll be a big shift. I mean, that's not what we have today in a phone based model. Right. So if I uh, let me try to rephrase that I, again, I, I want to make sure I understand you're saying there's two main things. The first one is it's a really hard a problem that requires as much input as we can. And so that's the cooperation aspect of like every right. company is going to provide a different piece of that puzzle. And the more pieces we have, the better the puzzle. Mm -hmm. That's that analogy starts breaking down. I think you know what I mean. Like, yeah. yeah. The more players we have, the the better it yeah. can be. So that's the cooperation. And then the reason why going open is is have the widest adoption possible that it, it can be great, but if nobody uses it, it doesn't matter. And so that's more about building a, a good standard that people would, would use. Yeah. And, but then the other part I think is, is this idea of um, we're not looking at a map. We're in the map. We are the, the map no longer is something we look at on a phone, but it's something that is actually imprinted on the world around us. And, um, and that requires that, different people using different products, right? I mean, at some point, our eyes aren't evolving to this. This is like wearing a product, need to be able to interact with that. So, so here's an example, right? If we're living in an environment in the not super distant future where augmented reality is, is a part of the map, then you and I need to be able to say, see the same augmented reality artifacts, regardless of what product uh, you know what headset you're wearing or what headset i'm wearing right and so if we're going to see that and interact with it one, one of the early examples i i had is in augmented reality let's say you're wearing a product from one company i'm wearing a product from another company and we're throwing a virtual ball back and forth to each other how do we coordinate that right it, we need to be able to understand the same digital assets in the way same way we understand the physical assets and the interaction so i think um i think that becomes a bigger and bigger part of it um by the way there's i think a different analogy on autonomous vehicles because you know if you think about autonomous vehicles there's a competitive aspect to building autonomous vehicle maps but there's also a safety aspect and one of the things that i think you could build a strong argument for is that your safety from an autonomous vehicle navigation perspective shouldn't be dependent on the brand of car you choose chose right um and so you know how do you build the safest map right maybe it's through collaboration right and so, but again, like you could all do those things and just decide we're going to sell our own thing. The like you could still say we want this uh, to be this common idea, but then sell it. And so you're saying that the the reason why it would be open is just makes it easier for everybody to use. Yeah. Again, I'd go back to it makes makes it everyone to participate in building it, and it makes it easier for people to use as well. That makes sense. You know, and, and the other part of that, and, and maybe this is like the intersection is, 
Um, we've talked about a uh, stable reference system, which basically allows you to append other data onto data in the map. So, you know, you can think about that in a variety of ways, right? If I have a place, right, that place has a name and address, that address has a lot long, that might all be open. But think about the data you want to add to that, right? And if you're a company, you might want to add reviews and things like that. A rideshare company might want to add pick up and drop off. A delivery company might want to say, where do you go? Where's the loading dock? All that data needs to add to the map. And that's not necessarily open, right? In fact, in a lot of cases, that's highly proprietary, but it needs to reference in a stable way to something on the map as well. And so not everything's open, right? I mean, or at least um, but 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 I think significant parts of it can be. Again, like one of the things that I saw when I, I saw the announcement is there's two really big companies that are not there that have big things in Maps as well, which is Google and Apple. Um, Google Maps is like this huge thing, and Apple is also putting a lot of beans on their maps. Um, the first question I want to ask: Did, did you actually, in, when building? The foundation. Did you actually reach out to Google and Apple to to see if they wanted to be a part of it? So when we built Overture, and this kind of came from a little bit of painful experience, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was come up with the idea and launch it with a fairly small number of people that, um, and then and then bring other people in to join, and and that was kind of the intent. Uh, from the beginning. And that, that, you know, some people could take issue with that. But one of the things that we found, uh, you know, and again, I've, I've kind of been down this road a couple times, is if you open up, the more people uh, that get involved early on, we would be spending the next two years still talking about how we were going to do it. And so to some extent, um, you know, people have asked me in the last four months, why wasn't so and so in? Why wasn't this company in? Um, the number of companies that weren't in is much bigger than the number of companies that were. And really, what we what we hoped to do was was launch it with actually the fewest number of companies um, that we could. One of the things is all the companies that launched it had significant uh, existing investments in open data, right? So so open data was a significant part of. Um, of 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 it because if you weren't kind of leaning towards open data then probably leaning further towards open data wasn't going to make sense and so uh you know that i think goes more towards like who was in you know smallest number of people pretty heavily involved in open data already uh and and something that we thought we could build a base on and then grow from there the the, the one thing and you know maybe this is like you know, as, as I sort of replay it in my mind is I think that the goal of Overture has always been to expand. And I think since we launched it, it has been expanding. And those those companies that have joined come from a fairly wide spectrum of sizes and, and places in the market. Um, the, the, perhaps the negative of launching it with a small number is that it looked like it was, you know, for a certain type of company. And that was never the intent. Uh, and I, I think, you know, look, I, I think if we're successful after a year, it'll be a lot less important who the founders were and much more important who's joined since. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the reason I'm asking is specifically because those two companies have a big presence in, in Map. I think if you're on your phone, you're probably using either Apple Maps or Google Maps for most people. Um, and that's that's a very specific use case, but that's why I'm asking. I think Google, I, I, I think, and I, I'd love to ask someone there, but to me, Google Maps is just an ad business. And that's the whole thing that it's built on. And that's how it makes money uh, is, is just, it's Google search, but on a map. And so that's how they're able to fund the whole thing. And it's a completely entire different project. Um, but it's based on having the best map as well and making sure that when it recommends you thing, it's the best, uh, it's giving you reviews, but also getting you to, I don't know, a restaurant or something like that. And, and that's why I was really curious to ask because it's it, in a way it's, uh, it's a competing version of the map and then Apple has its own thing as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, but, it, but it's interesting because you've got to look at this 
like in where where it's come from, where it is now and where it's going. And, you know, like when I started in mapping, um, the the conventional wisdom was no one would ever build another digital map. There were essentially two companies who built it and everyone thought like this is just way too hard. No one would ever there will never be a third map. What what were and, those two companies that because I'm not uh, actually not at sure. the time they were they were Navtech and Telatlas who okay. uh, Navtech became here and Telatlas uh, became TomTom. But th but the conventional wisdom was no one would ever do that. But then like it turns out someone did, right? I mean Google and about I'll get my date wrong. Someone will correct me. 2008 or so started building their own map data. Uh, Apple later started building a lot of their open map data and OpenStreetMap happened. Right. And, and OpenStreetMap was like, that was a crazy idea, um, but it was phenomenally successful. And I think part of that is that um, the tools to do that became much better. Right. When I started OpenStreetMap, you were walking around with weird GPS like receivers and getting traces and putting them in this thing called potlatch. I mean, it's just weird, but now that's like super easy, right? I mean, now you can do that on your phone. The editing tools are so much better. So, so I think a lot of things changed, but at the same time, you have to look where it's going forward. And like, if you think about this thing where the map, like take it to the extreme, right? Where the map has to be updated, like in real time, then you kind of wonder like, is it, is it, is that something that one company can or should do is that a good is that a good value proposition and i i don't think it is i mean i think that i think that um you know if you can see your way to build a jointly held open map that everyone can use all of a sudden you've got a very different uh market right because the map like you said, maps are hard. The reason maps are hard is because data is hard, right? I mean, the map software and my software friends are going to be mad at me. It's kind of hard, but it's not as hard as the data, right? The, the, you know, the data is the part that takes the huge, huge investment. And so if you can change that and fundamentally make that available to people, then people compete on different things, right? And, and I think that, uh, you know, that's a big change in the mapping market. Yeah, I'm already curious to see where this is going to go in a in a few years and and how that's going to change. Do, do you know the um do you know the example of the monkey in the platform? Do you know that the no. analogy? It's like if you're doing something really hard, it, it, the question is uh, your job is to train a monkey to juggle flaming batons while standing on a platform. What do you do first? And as you think about that, what you do first is you find a monkey and see if you can train it to juggle flaming batons because because if you can do that then building the platform isn't super hard but when you think about it in context a lot of people start that by building the platform like in various examples and so when we looked at that the the hard part of mapping is the data if you can if you can solve the data problem then the software problem is is very manageable um so that that's really why we pick data right yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So someone else said that look it up on the internet. There's a much better description of the monkey in the platform than I just gave you. Yeah, but I see what you mean. It's like uh, figuring out what's the hardest problem to solve. What's the hardest problem to solve? And right. uh, you know, because I th and you know, look, mapping software is very hard too, but mapping software can take tens of people, small number of years. Map data takes thousands of people forever. And um, I, mean, I mean, that's what history has shown, right? It just takes a lot of people, a, a lot of resources. I want to ask you about the, uh, the, the way decisions are, are, are made and how they're going to be made. Um, a lot of these open projects have these, uh, this notion of, I think it's called benevolent leader for life, something like that. So Linux has that um, blender, the uh, 3D software also has that is the idea that it's it's an open uh, project. It's uh, anybody can contribute, anybody can uh, use it, but it's not done by the, the decisions are not done by a community, a committee. They're done by a single person and and kind of like the the equivalent of a CEO that says this is what we're going to do, and it's not done by a, a committee. 
Um, and that means that you're at the whims of that person, but there are decisions that are made. I'm really curious, is, is that kind of the role that you're going to take at, at a much lower scale? And <laughs> oh, I because hope so. No, <laughs> no, no, no. But you I know mean, what I'm, I'm, I mean is like, because a lot yeah. of these open <clears throat> projects are kind of end up on, on that way. And, and a lot of the time it starts by the person founding the projects. And I understand this is a little bit different, but I'm really curious as to, this is basically a question around like, how is the foundation going to make decisions moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, so you know, this is one of the benefits, and we haven't really talked about uh, Overture as part as a Linux Foundation project. But one mm -hmm. of the things that uh, you know you get by being part of the Linux Foundation is kind of access to how uh, you know what are best practices, what are best models in that. But but with Overture specifically, um, you know, what you're trying to strike a balance of here is is a democratic process which is open to the best inputs from the community, right? That's that's what you want. Um, but at the same time, it needs to be decisions need to be made. And one of the things that we said from the very outset of Overture is that um you know, Overture can have a point of view, right? At some point, decisions do need to be made and you need to move on because otherwise you're just not going to get there. From a, from a structure standpoint, uh, the structure is kind of a graded structure where uh, uh, members have say in the priorities at different levels depending on where they join. So fundamentally what it is, there are three, three membership levels. At the steering level, the way to think about it, at the steering level, those people can establish the priorities and budgets for the project overall. So if you think about we're building map data, the next question is like, what map data? Where are you going to build it? What geographies are you going to focus on? How are you going to do things like that? Um, the steering committee will look at those types of things, right? Which are the priorities? What's the order in which we're going to take things? Um, you know, where do we steer the direction? The real work of building the maps is done at working group level. And the working group level um, is influenced kind of in a, a little bit of a combination of things. One is the people who bring the best ideas and the most energy to it obviously have a lot of uh, influence because good ideas should should win. Uh, but there's also a decision making process and it's focused on consensus, but there is also a voting mechanism. And at the general level of membership, that's where those people can really control the direction of the working groups. At the same time, you also want people to be able to join who can contribute, whether it's data or ideas. And we've had a lot of people join at what's called the contributor level. Um, and those are people like to give you an example. Um, if you have a uh, mapping technology that maybe isn't going to be open right away, like if you take autonomous vehicles, right? Um, Overture is not going to build autonomous vehicle maps anytime in the in the in the near future. But the base maps that Overture builds should ladder up to autonomous vehicle maps. It's super helpful to have people in the community who are looking at autonomous vehicles who can say, these are the type of needs we're going to have. It needs to be able to comprehend those needs and build towards them. And so, uh, you know, that is valuable contribution, right? Um, and and so you try and let all those ideas in uh, and, you know, hopefully decide on on the uh, the best ideas, the priority is on consensus decision making, uh, but there is options for voting as well. Right. So that's where, as you said, being a part of the Linux foundations, probably they, they probably have uh, decades of experience managing projects in, in, in that way at this point. Yeah, I mean, a lot of experience in it. Um, I think the, you know, the Linux Foundation does several things for it. One is a very strong sense of best practices in open source, uh, open source communities. And, you know, one of the things I'm excited about is to kind of learn from other communities, um, you know, what those best practices are. I think the other thing is it moves it uh, to an independent uh, organization, right? It's not controlled by one organization or another, certainly not controlled by me. Um, and I think, I think that level of independence is, is, is good, right? Because this can't be seen as a project of any one or two companies. It really should be a, uh, a shared project. And I think the third thing that the Linux foundation, uh, allowed us to do when we were looking at it is get this started without focus mostly on the mission 
and less on putting the infrastructure around it that it needs to be successful. And, um, you know, that's kind of how the Linux Foundation is set up. And so, uh, you know, it feels like a really good fit. Right. Yeah, I see. So you're not going to be benevolent dictator for life of Overture. No, I didn't know that was an option, but I, uh, I, I should have negotiated her. No, the, no, I think, you know, if I look at my role on there, um, you know, one, one of the main things in, in my role is, um, you know, to some extent, um, providing the link between the execution and the strategy, right? I mean, so if you think about uh, developing a strategy and that strategy needs to be uh, uh, instantiated in the execution of things. So whether we're focused on priorities, who our customer is, um, you know, what we're trying to build, a lot of those, um, you know, you need to build that connection between what's the strategy and where are we going and what are the working groups working on. Um, and then the other part is, is I think, growth of the organization. I think, um, you know, and, and I don't view growth as like growth for growth's sake. I think that growth is an outcome of doing the right things. Um, but to a certain extent, the more people join the community, the more inputs we have, the better the data becomes. And I think, you know, one of the things as I'm talking to people about joining, one of the things I'm sort of focused in on is what do you bring to the community? What can you bring and kind of put in the pot that will make this better? And, um, and I think that's like going to continue to be an important thing. Um, How many people are working within the foundation at the moment? Like, what does that look like? right now within the foundation mm -hmm. uh, working on overture mm -hmm. uh overture has as of today one full-time employee <laughs> okay <laughs> yesterday it didn't have any i mean today when we when we uh yeah. when we launched this um okay yeah so so the the way it works is um is uh overture overture has contributions from a couple different places one is uh, and the most important thing is members contribute and they don't just contribute money. They don't just contribute data, but they also contribute engineering, engineering headcount. That's why and so, and, and that's, and that's key. I mean, that's like the lifeblood. I think that's the lifeblood of any open source project, right? Is, is, um, the, uh, the contribution of members. So, you know, we put out in April, we put out sort of a demonstration data set, but one of the things we did there, just to give you an example is. We used some aerial LIDAR data from the United States Geological Survey. They had a project called 3 Depth. They had LIDAR data. We used building footprint data from a couple open source, uh, open source uh, sources from Microsoft and OpenStreetMap. But then we put a lot of engineering into it to look at the LIDAR data, cut it by the building footprints, subtract the digital elevation model for the base uh, level, and develop building heights. So that data didn't build itself. That data got built by some very clever engineers doing work to go make those things happen. And I think that is like a key part of it is like, who are those engineers? What's the work they're doing uh, to build it? And so, um, you know, th that's sort of life better. The other way, and I think this is where the Linux Foundation comes in, is in doing um, a foundation, there's a lot of other things that need to be done that are not necessarily data building. Uh, and that is, you know, program management, um, building the community, there's legal support, there's marketing support, there's a number of other things. And I think the Linux Foundation is very good at sort of putting those pieces, uh, making those pieces available. Um, and really what that does is it means you don't have to spin them up for yourself, right? You can access those through the Linux Foundation. That, that, that's what I was going to ask is like, where does the engineering, because we've been talking a lot about, you know, we talked about yeah. the, those three different sources that can come, uh, where the data can come from, from community maps, government, open government data, and then just building uh, machine learning and, and extracting data. The example that you, you brought is a lot of engineering. It seems like that's going to be a core part of what the foundation Absolutely. does forward. And even today it is, I mean, like, like inside, right. That we have, you know, we, we have a Slack community and, and we're on GitHub and inside those engineers from different companies are working together and developing things. So, you know, right now sort of job one was think a lot about the schema and, you know, we have people from about 
a dozen companies now weighing in on what the schema needs to be. And they don't always see eye to eye, but but they are working on that and doing real work on it. And and I think as we get to the building data phases, that becomes even more important. Do, do you see this is I, I, I have no idea how these foundations are usually run, but is there plans of hiring engineers directly within the, the foundation? Uh yeah, we we talked a lot about that when we were sort of envisioning this, and uh, the the code we talked about when we were doing is is a fat organization or a thin organization. How how fat right. or thin? Um, and and I think the conclusion we came to is it would be as fat as it needs to be. Um, you know, there there is a possibility of hiring uh, engineers in it in the organization. But I think that, you know, the, the core to collaborative open source projects is that the members see value and, and contribute internally. Um, I think that what the, uh, what the, the, the organization can bring is direction um, and, you know, sort of steering in terms of where it goes and, and resolving issues. But I, I, I don't think the primary um, mode would be, uh, you know, if if all we did was transfer all the work to the Overture Foundation, do all the engineering, I don't think it would be nearly as rich a uh, a project as as I think it can be. Right, because right now it it allows you to be more nimble in in the the engineering and the, and the people that you have access to. Yeah, and and I mean, I mean, the the kind of the things you have in your cupboard in terms of technology and data, I think will very quickly. It's already becoming pretty impressive. And, um, you know, so, so one of the things is like, we're, we're thinking about data in sort of three different ways. And one way is you could contribute what we call primary data and primary data is stuff that goes directly into the maps, right? You've got addresses, you've got road center lines, it can go straight into the map. The other way is there could be data, um, you know, which is open data, which is doesn't go into the map, but if you process it, um, then you can create map data, right? So whether you have, um, you know, great example is the USGS uh, three DAP program has lidar data. Lidar data doesn't go into the map, but we can process it to get data that's valuable to the map. And then the the third category is data which might be made available for specific use cases. Uh, so in other words, the data is not being made open but it's being made open to be used in specific use cases to create data. So I'll give you an example, um, someone might have aerial imagery to use an example we talked about before. They don't want to make that aerial imagery open, but they might allow it to be used by another partner and process to extract, to use our example, crosswalks and put that in. So kind of limited use data. So I think there's a pretty strong, I mean, like, like I kind of look at this stuff and I think, Man, the reason you do this in community, because no one company, I mean, you don't want that to, to have that all on one company. I mean, that's going to come from a lot of different places. And then, you know, beyond the inputs, the processes, right? What are the AI, what are the uh, processes that happen uh, to be able to build that data? The thing that this brings to mind to me is is the the idea of copyright or licensing i feel like engineering is a is a really big topic but i'm guessing the legal aspect is a is an entirely other part of work that's going to be required because the, the that to stay on that example that you mentioned that aerial image the there's the the data itself and there's the information that can be extracted from that image and so if you get the cross the the crossroads from that satellite some from that aerial image, who owns that and like what's the copyright that happens behind that and who can use that behind? I can imagine that's an entire new yes yes I don't even um, know what word to use but challenge basically. Well, it, it is and and it's uh, it's somewhat more complex. So let me um, so. From an overture standpoint, um, we prefer that data in and data out all be under obviously open source licenses. And the the license we prefer is CDLA Permissive 2.0, which is a pretty permissive open source license. We talk to a lot of open source lawyers 
Um, and and uh, that was the one that we arrived on. There, there are other choices, but that seemed to be one of the ones. And it's a pretty permissive open source license. Um, one of the one of the things that we also realize is that a significant amount of our input right now is under the ODBL license. Uh, specifically, all of OSM is ODBL, and ODBL license needs to retain that ODBL license uh, as it goes out. Whether it, it whether the data in is ODBL and use it directly, like if we were to use OSM data. Or if you derive data from that, it needs to be under ODBL. So that's you know that's a uh, license requirement of that of uh, that type of data, and we need to retain that. Um, ultimately, what it says is that the data needs to have some sense of what license is attached to it, and I think that's one of the one of the com complexities. Actually, I'm not sure if I'll regret saying this, but I don't think the complexity is understanding how. I think it or or what is required. I think it's how to do it, how to attach um, licenses to different layers of data in a in a coherent way. Right. So I can imagine, like, I'm not familiar with those licensing, uh, to, to be honest. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. But what I'm hearing is that it, it seems like it's it's there's two things that you need to merge together. There's the data itself, and then there's the licensing around those. It, it, it's It's actually two problems in one. It's not just a data problem. Yeah, and I think um, you know, and I think the the next level of that is different licenses have different implications, and um, I think you know we talked to one of the things that was interesting in putting this together is we talked to some very very good open source lawyers, and um, I think the trend there on open source is to be fairly permissive. You know, one of the things you always worry about in open source is the the free rider problem. The people who come in use your data and um, and don't contribute back. I think that to some extent in open source, you you acknowledge that that's going to happen. And the real challenge it puts is to build a community that's productive enough that people see the value of contributing to it. Um, other ways of doing that have tried to do it through the license, but it ends up becoming super complex. And, uh, um, you know, we wanted to avoid that. This this makes me think a lot of a lot of the conversations that are happening in the Earth observation side of things as well which is that there's a lot of it's, it's really hard to still get your hands on satellite images at the moment and part of that is the licensing and there's a bit of a move at the moment which is recognizing that the value of images is also the timeliness in which you get them and so opening up archival imagery is actually not that big of a deal because Knowing what happened a year ago is ne not nearly as valuable as knowing what happened 12 hours ago. And so you you kind of have this idea where you become, you can help people build something based on the archival of, of the data. But if you want to make anything of value, you're going to need still, you're, you're going to be dependent basically on that data stream. And so being open isn't near, it, it doesn't really have that problem of the the freeloading basically because you can help people uh even people who freeload they they have access to that archival but in some ways without access to the stream you can't really go that far it seems like it's quite reminiscent of 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 this yeah you know i think i think the difficulty is is generalizing right i mean th there are many mm -hmm. things for which archival data works just fine right i mean i in my little neighborhood out here I don't think the streets have changed in 30 years, That's right? Very so, fair. So, <laughs> so, so, so like I could buy satellite imagery from, you know, Landsat, yeah. not Landsat, but I mean, I could buy old satellite imagery and draw a pretty good map of my neighborhood. But there are other applications where it's super important. And, um, you know, so, so I think it, it's somewhat use case dependent. Um, but I think more and more that, you know, as data uh, recency is becoming more and more available, people build into that and i think uh, i think those things uh those things yeah. become become more important but but you know your point is a good one which is um to some extent map data has a value based on how recently it was captured right the world kind of changes a lot the more you capture those changes the better it is and so you know one of the things is how do you kind of move the slider there to get what you need for the best value because 
the stuff that is most recent is typically going to be, at least in a commercial sense, most expensive. Let's let's look ahead a little bit. Like, what is of a, of what you can talk about? Like, what are the things coming up in the next few months, years for for the foundation, or or at least what are you excited about? Yeah, um, you know, so so it's interesting since we started. Uh, a lot of the work has been on some groundwork uh, frameworks that need to be in place. Uh, and so a lot of the work has been on developing um, a schema and a, a reference entity system, which you got to kind of be like high level map geek to get very excited about it. It's, <laughs> it, it's fundamental and it's super important and it's very important for our target customer. Two things. One is that the data come out in a structured way where it's understood and can be documented so they can build services around it. And the other is that, and this is a reference system, that they could add data onto that. That's like incredibly important. So it's very important. It's important to be done first because as you're building data, you want to to kind of know what it is. So in a way that has been important, the 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 problem with it is like everyone wants to build data, right? I mean, mm. you don't want to build schema, yeah. you want to build data, right? And and so um so I think in the very near future, um, you know, we'll come out with some some information on where we're going directionally with schema. And look, everyone kind of looks at things and think, oh, that's the finished product. It's not the finished product. I mean, all these things will evolve. Um, but but I think directionally we'll get some things. And part of what we're trying to do there is get feedback, right? We're we're aiming at a specific customer base. And if people look at that schema and say, I like this, I don't like this, I wish it had that, that's exactly why we're putting it out there is, is to do that. I think once we do that, then what, you know, then the focus will become on building the data. And what we've seen, you know, when you go to build open map data, the the obvious question is like, well, what are you going to build, right? What what part, of, which layers of map data? And a lot of the work right now is coalescing around um, four areas. And, and, and this is driven by the interest of the members who have joined so far. And one area is transportation, so road networks and, and uh, that piece of it. The other is places data, very high interest in places data uh, as, a, as a mapping component. The third is um, 3D, especially like buildings uh, that are you know three-dimensional and, and have accurate uh, Z-dimension primarily. And the fourth is uh, administrative boundaries, because I think I think that feels like something that could and should be open. So initially, I think what will happen on the data building is groups will kind of cluster around that depending on their interests. So if you come into the community, you're very interested in road networks, then that would be the most likely cluster. Or you may be more interested in places data, or you're more interested in 3D data for digital twin work. And I think people will sort of cluster into those groups. And then down the road, if... Um, you know, someone else comes in and wants to build, you know, contour lines for topographic maps or something, or mm -hmm. wants to focus on a different region. I think that will be driven largely by the membership and where their expressed interest is. So, so that's kind of the next phase. Then the phase after that, that I think is like super exciting is how do you start building data? How do you start thinking about what this community brings in terms of inputs and in terms of processes to build new data? And that's where, um, you know, I, I, I just like, I, I don't know that, that we will ever be able to think far enough out in the future to, to really comprehend that. But, you know, I look at how you build map data and how that's changed in the last 10 years and just trying to project it ahead. I think one of the things that the organization needs to be doing is really leaning into the technologies that will be here in a few years, because that's what's going to be necessary to build for the markets that will be here in a few years. Now, it sounds like we're going to have to have this conversation again in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mark, I think this is a nice place to, to start rounding it off. Um, just the way I like starting these conversations, the same way I like rounding it up the same as well. I like asking for a, a book or a po and a podcast, actually, a uh, recommendation. Doesn't have to be about anything that, that we talked about. I mean, if it was sci-fi, that'd be actually pretty cool and on topic, but I'll be open to anything. Um, and I like asking because I think it's a, it's a nice way to know a little bit more about people's interest and just recommending books and podcasts, I think, goes a lot by, by word of mouth. 
I'll give a plug for this. So, so I'll, I'll stay in on, on brand, right. And talk about okay. mapping, but um, do you know this book? Sorry, uh, Never uh, Lost Bill Again is, by Bill Never Kill- Lost Again by Bill no. Kilday. Um, this is a book. Bill Kilday was the marketing, I, I'll get his title wrong. Sorry, Bill. Marketing manager for Keyhole and then Google Maps in the early days. And uh, it's a story of Google Maps. And I think if you're in the map industry, um, it's a fascinating story. It's it's not so fascinating if you're not in the map industry, but if you are, it's it's really a, I think a very interesting story of how um, you know it, one of the points of title never lost again talks to the societal impact of that product. Right? Is like you know in in a span of a few fairly short years, our expectation is we're never lost again. Right? We always know not just where we are but like what's around us. And um, it's an amazing story. I, I read it somewhat actively and you can see I marked oh, yeah. the parts that were interesting. So for people it. listening, there's like a hundred post-its on the side of the book. <laughs> but I thought, I thought, you know, one, if you're interested in the mapping market, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, but it really gets to sort of, you know, a real commitment to building a great product. And, and I, I, I just think it's very good. Um, Bill Kilday does not pay me a commission, though I wish I'd arranged that with him before <laughs> I started pitching the book. Um, uh, but it's uh, um, no, I think that's very good. Um, uh, it, podcasts. Uh, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I, I listen to a disproportionately high number of mapping podcasts, which um, uh, because I, th- I think it's an interesting. You know, I think I, I, I love hearing where people are thinking about what they're doing, what's going on. I think one of the hard things if you're in a company, and especially if you're in a big company, is you're so heads down on what you're doing. It's sometimes very hard to kind of see out of the corner of your eye, what other people are doing and remain interested and do it. And so I I think that, um, I think that just in general, like being able to get different perspectives is, is one of the key things I look for a podcast, whether it's in, you know, I, I think if I listen to podcasts, I listen to, um, a lot of mapping ones, but I also listen to a lot of kind of, um, political philosophy and, and, um, you know, the United States, I think is in a pretty challenging political environment right now, and, and it's impacting society and economics. And I think being able to listen to people who you don't necessarily always agree with, um, Mm -hmm. and understand their point of view is something that like, I, I try to do. Um, I, I don't think anyone does it perfectly, but I am, uh, I, uh, if you want to name, I really like this guy named Yasha Monk and a, a podcast called The Good Fight. I just think he's a smart, intelligent, uh, um, really thoughtful uh, 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 person. Yeah, I, I haven't heard about that. I'll I'll, I'll go check it out. Um, <laughs> there are only like 40 million podcasts out there. Yeah, I right. Know. I mean, it's kind of like the same for books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's why I like asking about it. It's because like I I actually never heard about that book before, but it sounds really interesting. I mean, we just talked for maps for like an hour and a half, so of course uh, I'm the target. Well, audience. you know, it's it, it's uh, I mean, Bill had a really interesting viewpoint uh, there, uh, kind of just being able to observe it. Uh, Bill, by the way, is at Niantic now, so he's still kind of in the biz. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, you ought to get him on. It's a it's a fascinating book. That does sound like a, it would be like a really cool conversation. Um, I have to ask, like, do you, do you like science fiction still? Because we like talked about that a bit. Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think uh, I think I think my life has enough science. I don't know what nonfiction <laughs> is. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't read a lot of science right. fiction. I, I, I don't I, I don't uh, do a lot. You know, it's funny in my in my non business world. I, I tend to be a little retro. I mean, I tend to be much more likely to, um, you know, go out for a hike in the in backpacking in the mountains and putting on a uh, a headset. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that that makes total sense. Yeah. I, I, I I think that I you know I value it, but I you know for me personally, I think I, I'm much more likely to like go out backpacking than than and get away from tech than yeah, uh, that makes sense. Dive in deeper. Let me ask you one last thing. Did did you? sometimes take a look back at like how far things have come since you've started working in the industry. Like I, I think that example of the, the GPS, like, which is one inside of like when you started working, do, do you ever take some time to look back at how far we've come? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, and it's funny because I think, and, and you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm 
older than many, but not super old, right? No, and I know. It's not, you know, but <laughs> but um, but you know, I, I've worked in this industry. I think I started in 1995, right? That's when I started in GPS. So you're like, you know, uh, you know, it's been a while. But but what's really amazing is how far it's come. And the other part, I guess, I would think about on that is how. When you're in the moment, it seems like it's taking forever, right? In, in any given year, like I'm just super impatient. Like, can't we get there? Can't we get there? Why isn't the technology better? That kind of thing. And, you know, there's that saying that things move slowly at first and then fast. And um, it, it's just interesting over time that things actually do change and they do get better. Um, and one of the things that I think I've found like in my own self is I think I'm fairly good at predicting what's going to happen and fairly bad at predicting when it's going to happen. Um, I, the timing is much, much harder than like what's going to happen. I mean, you know, to your point or the point we made earlier, right? I mean, a lot of people could see all these things that GPS was going to enable, but predicting when they were going to happen and what was kind of the unique combination of things that, you know, if you think about it, like, like, for GPS to become super integral to everything we were doing, it needed to be part of something like an iPhone, which needed to be part of cellular networks, which had the bandwidth to do those things and the processing. And, you know, a bunch of things had to come together. It wasn't just GPS getting better. And, and so that's why I think like predicting when things are going to happen is super hard. I'm, I'm, I wish I were better at it. Do you find that it's usually too people predict too short or too far out or it's just all over the place oh i i mean invariably people think things are going to happen sooner than they do and you know i i worked at uber a while back and one night uh vc brought a bunch of people from the autonomous vehicle community together and they kicked off the conversation and said when is autonomous when will autonomous vehicles be here and everyone kind of in one voice said two years <laughs> like five years ago, and and then they spent the rest of the reason the rest of the evening walking back two years by adding caveats. Well, not fully autonomous, not in all environment, you know. And like they walked back, and so I think people always think these things are going to happen sooner. And um, you know, and and look, you know, and it, companies benefit from from impatience, right? I mean, we benefit from trying to push these things and make them happen, but. Um, like, like I say, there are probably others who are better at predicting it than I am, but like, I'm just not great at predicting when things will happen. Mark, thanks a lot for uh, spending some of your valuable time with me. This was a great conversation. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Maxine, great to, uh, you know, appreciate the work you do. And, you know, like I say, I, I've been in mapping for a long time, mostly because I think the people are great. I mean, I just like the people. It's a it's a community that is knowable, and um, you know you can know the people in it without too much effort, right? And and uh, and so it's really fun to uh, to listen to you interview. You know, I love when you interview folks I know, and it's just great. I learn about them every day. So I'm very grateful that people like yourself can give me some of their time and talk about kind of how they're thinking and everything is great to, to, to be able to have these conversations. So I do appreciate Good. that a lot. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation. If you found it valuable, please consider supporting my work on Patreon. I want to keep the ad load as minimal as I can, and I want to do more of these conversations in person. I want to spend more time researching them and producing them as best as I can. If this sounds something you'd like to be a part of and contribute to, please consider going to Patreon and supporting this work there. That's the best way you can help me make more of these episodes. I'll have a link in the show notes explaining a little bit more about what I want to do for the future of the podcast, and I'd love to do so with your support. Either way, thank you so much for your time, for listening all the way here, and I hope to see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.